they can strap a car to a dyno, they install the supercharger, they put a turbo system on, they change out wheels, tires, brakes, suspension. Uh, they at least have the fundamental, the basics from where they can build on. And uh, we run 45 to 60 students a year through the program. It's kind of neat to see where they end up going. Some, some will go back to school, some may go down a different career path, but probably 60, 70 percent end up doing something in the industry with, uh, with what they learn at junior school. The thing I tell them when they come in, I'm like, whether you do this as a career, temporary, or long term, if you're here because you love cars, which they all do, I'm like, you'll be able to use what you learn at junior school for the rest of your life. And, and um, the other big part of that story is, what I tell them is that you know, for every one thing that I've learned that works on making a car go fast, I've probably discovered 10 other things that didn't work and it costs me time, it costs me money. Uh, and, and so, kind of the purpose of the school is for them to experience stuff, make mistakes, kind of learn what their skills and abilities are. We kind of observe that in them and kind of say, well, hey, look, you know, you might be a good fabricator, a good technician, or maybe you're not good at that stuff, and maybe you're a good talker and you can be in customer service as well. So there's lots of variety. If you guys have ever been to SEMA, it's just like total, I mean, there's so many, I mean, it's, multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry of, of modifying. We're just a tiny, tiny little niche of people with these particular cars that want to add horsepower. But the whole idea of just modifying cars in general is, uh, is a pretty, pretty broad market. And so, um, anyway, any questions? Cool. All right, we'll keep wandering. Five to seven years that it's available, eventually the kind of the demand for what we do somewhat somewhat flattens out or declines. The Camaro just keeps coming in. It's the funniest thing. Um, a couple years ago, we, we had a couple opportunities to work with the state of Texas and the Department of Transportation where they had some new toll roads. And three years ago, we got a chance to take a, a 1200 horsepower Cadillac CTSV and a 750 horsepower Z1 Camaro to a new tow road by the F1 track in Austin, and the Camaro ran 204 and the Cadillac ran 221. And just by putting this video on YouTube, it's kept us pretty busy with both those vehicles over the last uh, couple, three years. And then about two years ago, we got a, the, the C7 Corvette had just been out, and another deal on the Grand Parkway, we got a chance to run a white Corvette. And they wanted the Venom GT, and I'm like, well, I just don't know that it's long enough or wide enough, and I'm like, I'll bring you something that'll run 200 mile an hour. So I had like 10 days. So we didn't have our supercharger system done. Twin turbo system wasn't done. And I'm like, nah, we, at that point, I think we had ported cylinder heads, camshaft headers. We were making probably 600 horsepower. I'm like, just not enough to break 200. So I'm like, just put a put 100 shot of nitrous on it. And give me a button. So if you watch the video, I get up to fifth gear and I hit this button. And people are like, what's that, what's that button for? But it gave us extra power, and, and so it was kind of a guess. I think on the dyno, it made right at 600 of the wheels. And it was just kind of a cold guess that that would be enough. So when we went out there, we're actually, the reason they let us on there, besides the publicity, was that they wanted to let us test out their their uh, their, their toll towers to make sure that it captured your license plate going really fast. And so, <laughs> so I wanted to hit the toll tower around it's 200. very scientific. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, the, so, the, so, the, so the first run was uh, like 197 or something, and I'm like, okay, well I'll just go a little further back, a little further back, and I literally went right through the toll towers like at 200.6, and then the power started kind of de like through the power was declining. I'm like, okay, I'm running low in nitrous, and that was it. <laughs> and, did it catch the plate? Did it catch the plate? It did. It did. It's the craziest thing. It's uh, you can't beat it then. You, 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 no, you not only can you not beat it. They have timing lights. So they know how fast you're going. Yeah. yeah. Now they're they're not they're not motivated to send anybody a ticket because then you wouldn't want to use the toll road, right? Yeah. Huh. But but they but they were within one mile an hour and it, it absolutely. Matter of fact, we put a we put a powered by pencil synthetics plate on the back of the car, which is kind of at the beginning of our relationship. And yeah, it, it, it captured as clear as day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was pretty funny. So. So that's kind of a, we we like to you know we bought the drive bought the drive strip 10 11 years ago um, we really like to validate what we do 
and um, not all of our customers are going to go out and go 200 or 270 or whatever, but some of them might, and and it's just something we like to push the envelope, and that's I think just kind of another you know, relevant connection to our relationship with with Penzol. You guys are just working your tail ends off over there at the Technology Center to make sure that you know whether it's Penske or Lagana or Formula One or you know Texas Tuner like me has got the best lubricant in the motor to keep us safe because we got a lot of things to worry about when we're out there trying to go 200 or 270 and worrying about lubrication for the motor when the oil temperature could be pushing 300 degrees and 7500 RPM at a really, really high load. Um, you know, we just get into our business and go out, and, go out and run the number, let the car, let the car do its job. So. And you're actually driving it? Well, it's funny, I, you know, I got a bunch of employees here and a lot of obligations and five kids and a wife and stuff. Yeah. I like to drive, I'd just be happy to drive everything, but there's an inherent risk to that, so we kind of felt like, okay, well, something happens to John, and then, you know, then what do we do? So we generally put a pro in the car for those type of deals, but on that particular short notice deal with the state, our driver already had another obligation, and I'm like, they, they they gave me a really nice a really nice uh, a racing suit. I'm like I'm gonna put on that racing suit, and jump in the car, and it was a lot of fun. So I'll get out and do something every now and then. But uh, on that particular deal with the Corvette, I got to drive it. So it's cool. We do a lot of a lot of trucks, a lot of SUVs. So um, one of the vehicles to take a look at outside. I think you guys saw the uh, the BBC top gear right before Jeremy Clarkson was let go from the BBC. They invited us to bring um, a specially modified Raptor truck, what we call the Velociraptor, to a deal they did in Canada. And uh, the folks at Penzel helped us build the, the, the vehicles. And we knew these guys were just gonna just pound the fool out of these things. And they did. And so the last the last vehicle feature story they did with Jeremy Clark and driving the vehicle on top here was the Penzel Velociraptor. You know, again, kind of another neat way where we've been able to do stuff together to uh, um, to have fun, you know what we do, but also show the relevance and the importance of you know having good lubrication in the motor. These guys are literally foot flat to the floor. Uh, the mountain in Canada, it's not like Colorado. The mountain was probably the base was probably three thousand feet. They probably went up to seven, eight thousand feet, but snow waist yeah, deep. Yeah. And it was, yeah, and, and uh, you know, they've got the diff lock, they've got it in, in full or low. Um, the, the, I know that uh, we didn't measure the oil temps on that particular deal, but the training temps were really, really high. And they had chains on it, so these guys they don't they really don't care. They're just like, give us the car, we're gonna pound the crap out of it, and if you don't like it, then we'll just get a different car, or we're we'll gonna buy our own car. Um, but my, my point is that, that it survived their. I don't know that we could find anybody more extreme than letting those guys just pitch them the keys to the vehicle. So, um, Do you get a lot of Mustangs? <laughs> we do a lot of Mustangs. It's so efficient Mustangs. I think that we're going to run caught up on them. We might, have, we might have three or four or five in the park. I don't even have a dozen here, but in the last year we built probably 100 Mustangs. Yeah, we probably built a dozen of them. The 750 package? The 750 would be the most popular. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, very, very popular. We had one, another, another kind of cool guy with Gondola. We had a uh, car that I owned that was black that we were trying to break 200 miles an hour with. And there was a test track over on the other side of San Antonio called the Empty Valley called, uh, it's owned by Continental Tires. And so they said, hey, you want to come test the car here? So I drove over there, the car ran 195, and we're having some issues raising the rev limit on the computer. But it was still pulling hard, and then a few months later, uh, Jay Leno's guys called up and said, Hey, look, we're looking for a kind of a cool story. We you got a fast Mustang, and you can break 200. I'm like, Yeah, I'm pretty sure it will. And that, that came out on CNBC uh, about a month ago. It re ran it like crazy over uh, over Thanksgiving, a pretty cool show. So we wrapped it, we wrapped it shell yellow and uh, tweaked it a little bit. And uh, it's kind of funny, we before we went to the track, we put it on the dyno, and they said, uh, can you show us it'll hit 200? We had done that like the day before, and on the particular day that they were here, it only hit like 194 on the dyno. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it'll still hit 200 on the track, and it did, but it was funny, they kind of, they, they caught me in with a, like, a little moment of doubt on my face. I'm like, I don't even remember that. But when they showed on TV, I'm like, okay, they're pretty good at what they do. Yeah.
Seven horsepower. Um, and what, what are they from the back? Like, what is the sticker? Uh, well, the sticker, like that one stickers at 57, I had to pay 10 over to get it. Is there yeah. a demand? Yeah, there's a lot of demand for this now. They're getting some pretty good press. And they are, it's a great car. It's a really, really good car. Um, but if you took that one that's 45,000, it has a lot of potential to make. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the car, the car that we ran in the in the Jay Leno, uh, uh, Jay Leno's garage episode. The car it ran almost 208 miles an hour. Started off as a forty thousand dollar um, Mustang GT with a lot more horsepower. Wow. We didn't really change the suspension. Didn't change the brakes. I mean, if you want to go have a balanced car, you should really do that. Yeah. But just 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 to demonstrate that the car is 200 plus mile an hour capable with some modifications to extra horsepower. It, it, I mean, it destroyed the 200 mile an hour mark. Yeah. 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 Pretty cool. So. What's the most money somebody's paid for you to modify a car? Outside of the Venom GT, um, we've got a handful of cars that, have, like we, like the Cadillac that we ran on the toll road in Austin, that went 221 and still pulling. We we that car we called it a VR1200. So we took about a. Seventy-five thousand dollar Cadillac CTSV coupe, and it had wide body, bigger wheels and tires, twelve hundred plus horsepower, brakes, interior. Those cars are on two hundred seventy grand. So we'll do like the Ford GT down there. That guy will spend probably a quarter million dollars on top of the cost of the car. Um, we'll do a dozen of those a year, maybe. I don't know even whether we make any money on those or not. I mean, it sounds like a lot of money. But it's a whole lot of work, and the cars are here, and it's a lot of engineering, a lot of testing, and uh, it's fun. I enjoy the challenge of it, but commercially, I don't know that it's the business model for. It sounds like you know mm -hmm. a big deal, but <coughs> you, just, you, can't, you just can't do enough volume on those type of things because they're like one-off, special. It's like building a custom Venom GT every time. You know? Yeah, and I was, I mean, I was more going of like, man, people really love their cars. Oh, just absolutely. Just spend a ton of money. No, absolutely, they do, and I think that to, to your point, that there's a there's a there's a definite niche of um, people want to be have something unique, and there's some folks like and the, that group of customers that'll spend that kind of money. They've got all kinds of cars, and but they can't get what we offer. They can't just go into a dealership, and you know they go buy a fast car from a dealership. I mean, there's some of the new supercars and new. 
P1 McLaren and the 918 Porsche for, you know, if you got one of those at a million to a million three, it's a heck of a lot of car. But still, there's 918 Porsche 918s. And some people just want one of one. They don't want anybody else having anything like what they have. So we do. We cater those. We're kind of like the character from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Crack His Pots. You know, build the, uh, build the big boy toys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's definitely interesting. You ever? Uh, no, I was just saying, do you? Um, I don't. I may have told this earlier, but do you play with engines yourself when you were growing up, like building them? I did. Yeah, I was out just you know, I'd say in the garage, but our garage, is, our house is full of junk. So my car, I had, a, I had a, my, my first car, was about when I was 15, was a 1969 Olds 442 convertible. And yeah, I think the first day I you know, had pop. Back in those days, I had the big, you know, quarter jet carburetor. So you take the lid on the air box and flip it upside down, thinking it's going to get more air into the, oh, yeah. more air into the uh, air filter of the car. And was always tinkering with it. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask if you've ever been approached to do one of those stupid drama type TV shows. Too many times. Too many, yeah? Too many times. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't know. It's, it sounds interesting and appealing, and I'm sure for like the Fast and Loud guys, you know, it's probably been financially beneficial for them. But for us, I, I'm not really interested in, in, I think most of the shows, everybody knows that they're all manufactured, yeah, yeah. not really scripted TV. They're yeah. not reality. It's not reality. And so, um, Generally, the producers are in charge of the the story and the content, and I just don't want to do anything here that would be, you know, disparaging to what we do, or you know. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's 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 drama in any any company, in any any organization, but I really don't feel like putting that out in the public domain, you know. So yeah, we've had those conversations, and who knows? We've talked, we thought about maybe doing our own show where we have all complete control over it. Um, but I think for now I'm just happy just building fast cars. And we did we did some we did a cool thing with with Penzl a couple years ago. We ran the, the Venom GT record. They kind of incorporate that into a documentary called Breaking Barriers. There's a DVD and all the old swag bags. So I think I got 45 50 minutes to watch. It's a pretty cool, mm-hmm. pretty cool story. It kind of talks about the whole just the whole mindset of why do why do crazy people like me want to break records and go faster than the other guy and the kind of the rivalries and yeah. stuff kind of going through the years. Yeah. Do you know those, like Lincoln Felter is a Corvette guy? Yeah, yeah. Do you know those guys? I know all those guys, yeah. yeah. John Lincoln Felter started the company. He passed away from a, as a result of a, of a crash that he was racing. Um, but his cousin or second cousin, Ken Lincoln Felter, bought the company all back and they, they continue on. But yeah, I know, I guess, Celine and yes, Callaway and Langan Felter and Roof and um, I'm trying to think who else. I, I met Carol Shelby several times. I don't I won't say that I knew him, but yeah. and I don't know that he knew, knew who I was, but yeah, yeah. he was always very nice to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, an elite fraternity. Kind of a little yeah, yeah. odd little bit. And there's a lot of other there's shops everywhere that are modify cars and specialize yeah. in yeah. different cars and. Uh, you know, but I think that we all kind of share that common passion for performance. And I mean, I get all the car driver motor train, you know, mm-hmm. and I knew when I got the invitation, Hennessy. I saw, yeah, I know Hennessy. I know they do Vipers. Mm-hmm. I knew, but I, I wasn't like totally up to speed on what to do. But I knew the name, and sure. I knew that you know, Vipers and Mustang. Uh huh. You know. yeah. So you know, this is great for yeah. actually meet you. That's cool. Yeah. Have you had a uh, favorite car that owned? Worked on? Yeah, I got a long list of favorites. Um, <laughs> you can't pick just one. I like well, I like the CTSC wagon. So I bought my wife a CTSC wagon recently. They don't make them anymore. They're kind of rare. <laughs> um, Ford GT is definitely on the list. The last generation zero one Corvette I like a lot. Uh, I like that new GT three fifty a lot. Um, we uh, I like the Hellcat a lot. The, the yellow uh, Penzl Airlift Drift Hellcat that they had, um, they kept it out here for a while and, I, and they needed a clutch. And 
you wanted me to check it out. So I drove it for, I drove it for about a week. I might have put probably about a thousand miles in that car. I really liked it a lot. A lot more than I thought it would. And no, it's not a road course car, and it's but for just comfortable. You like sitting in a big lazy boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's super right horsepower. Yeah. Yeah, and it still stops and turns pretty good. Got trunk. Got back seat. So interior is kind of cheap, but who cares? So, you know, it's fast. It sounds good. Um, what else? I'm equal opportunity. I like just anything that, go, anything that goes fast that we can modify. Have you modified like BMWs and models as well? We've done, uh, we've done Porsches. We've done Mercedes. BMWs are BMWs are tunable. They're a little more persnickety in that you have to you have to just do them just right, or you can actually lose horsepower. Mm -hmm. You can lose performance mm -hmm. in BMW. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, we may we actually had a conversation with some people at BMW. Couple days ago, so we may end up doing some more BMW stuff. People kind of know us for the American Muscle stuff, but we kind of there are times when you know, if there's demand for Mercedes or Jag or Range Rover, we'll do some of that stuff. But it's got to be demand. There's got to be you know a value proposition of we can deliver X amount of horsepower for some reasonable amount of money where we can be profitable, and then also we warranty what we do generally unless it's a race car or something we offer a warranty so if a client has a problem and we bring the vehicle back here and fix it. So what's the warranty then? Depends. It's generally like for most of our stuff it's three years, three six thousand miles, limited to the modifications that we perform. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's you know if there's ever any kind of a gray area with the dealer, the dealer's like, well we're not sure about this, we'll just bring it here and fix it. Mm -hmm. We'll take care of our clients. When you when you do like the, the car that we wrote in and you upgrade like valves and springs and stuff. Do you fabricate them yourself? Or we something? used to do that in house. I found that certain things like that, machine work, there's so many job shops that can do that stuff for us. I mean, not everybody can do it, but once we have a vendor that we're very comfortable with that does a good job for us, they do a dark spec. And um, I find that it's just, you know, if I was doing thousands of them, I you know, would probably bring in house, but we're doing dozens right. up to maybe a hundred or whatever, just work either just outsource it. Because just about, you know, if I was to bring in a bunch of equipment and people and kind of bring it all in house, just about the time I'm up to speed on that and that car kind of fades, fades away and something else is popular that it doesn't get that kind of machine work. So I like to be able, I like to contract or using it on a contract basis, that way I can ramp it up or ramp it down depending on the demand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had my own cylinder head border and equipment. And that and that and that is there's probably a couple hundred grand worth of equipment and you have a flat place to put it, so yeah. You know. Just use the bath source. <coughs> yeah. About how many cars per year do you have modify? About four to five hundred cars a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. Do you have any criteria for the people whose cars you modify or anyone that comes um, to you and has yeah. Well, that's uh, that's that's money. That's that's well, well yeah, you, 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 it, it, I would say that generally, if, you know, if it's a car like a Camaro or a Corvette or something that we offer, but every now and then we'll get a customer that has like really weird requests, and there's just stuff that we won't do. Okay. And if it has anything to do with altering the, the safety of the vehicle, hey, I want to put a, you know, like all the new seats, all the new seats all have airbags in them. They all have airbag sensors in them and stuff, and so. A race seat in, or the uh, most common one is like on the Raptors. The Raptors, the tires on the Raptors from the factory are rated 112 miles per hour, and they only go 100 miles an hour from the factory. Well, with our upgrade, we'll raise the speed limit to 110, so it's underneath that, that tire limit threshold. And they'll, we'll get a lot of Raptor people say, Wow, you know, just take that speed limit off of me. Well, I'll just sign something. We're not doing it, we're, there's some things that we don't do. So, so to answer your question is, is it, you know, hey, you got a fast car and you want to make it go faster and it's something we specialize in, no big deal, but all of a sudden when there's, oh, you know, there's like weird requests or deal breakers, then we just say, well, I'm sorry, we don't do that. Yeah. So. What's the average turnaround per car? Um, I, 30 days is our goal. Mm -hmm. Some cars, 
like the, over the summer we had we had we had a backlog and we had like over 100 cars in our backlog which then affects when somebody calls up and says hey i want to send my car in i wouldn't be able to touch it for three months so we caught up but we're caught i mean caught up now for us is 60 cars in production 40 of which are like production builds the other 20 are probably thousand horsepower deals or whatever but there's some stuff that we can turn out of here in a couple weeks and that's really kind of where i like because i think ultimately like if it were me and I go buy a new Mustang, I'm excited about it. I want to get it modified and upgraded. The sooner I get it back, the better. Mm -hmm. I find that for like, if it's somebody's everyday driver or maybe their second fun, secondary fun car, for probably 90% of our customers, 90 days. After 90 days, it's like, where's my car? And mm -hmm. in the beginning, they might say, take your time. I'm in no hurry for it <laughs> after 90 days. Because what happens is they get the car they get excited about, they tell their wife, their kids, their coworkers, their friends. And then after time, it's like, where's your car? You get your car. You know? And, and a lot of times it's not even us. It's like the customer will say, well, yeah, I want to do this. Then we get three quarter of the way done with the work or even done with work. Well, I want, to, I want to do more. Then I want to add some wheels. And it's kind of this never ending thing. And so we're, we're pretty careful to try to guide them in the path of success because a lot of people are excited and they don't, they maybe haven't modified a car before and I've done it, you know, many thousands of times. And so we try to guide them. We'll, we'll, don't try to get this wheel over here that takes four months to get it. That really is too heavy and it's going to hurt the performance of your car. Get the wheel that we sell, which is lighter, which has better performance, and we have them in stock or a supplier can deliver them in three or four weeks. That's a big part of what we do and why people come to us. And we have a, a lot of repeat business from our clients is that when they call up and they say, well, I want you to make the exhaust as loud as you can make it. And we say, well, we can do headers or we can do an exhaust, but you, you're not going to be happy if it's too loud. I don't want it. I don't care. I want it. I want it. Nope. So we just draw the lines and nope, we're only... And then after they have it for a while, they're like, yeah, you were right about that exhaust. I mean, <laughs> I like the way it sounds, but if it was any louder, my wife wouldn't run it. <laughs> yeah. How many people are you working for you? About 25. Yeah. And how many techs? Mm, probably all in, uh, eight, between 8 and 10. Mm -hmm. We have sales staff, accounting staff. Parts of purchasing, engineering, and our tuner school staff, instructors. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have our own video department, media department? So, uh, how much uh, interaction do you have to have with the actual builds? Do they need you to? Um, I, I'm, I'm real. I'm real into the details when something's brand new. When we're in the kind of R&D mm -hmm. phase, like mm -hmm. after we built, you know, the 500 Z28 Camaro, or whatever. Then I don't really. Get involved with it unless there's some unless there's something new that we're trying or customers asking for something special. Well, I really I love the whole testing process and the development of new. That, and this is kind of our time frame that we do a lot of this. In the summertime it's hot. And we don't test our cars much when it's 100 degrees, but from October through May it's kind of our we do a lot of our testing and go out to the track and runways and road courses and gather a lot of data. And Kind of analyze what we like, what we don't like, how do we, how do we want to improve it. We love working with the folks from Shell. They love to um, have very similar cultures from the standpoint that we like to push the boundaries and go fast, and we like to win. And I want to roll with the same level of excellence that the Shell Pencil people do. So it's been good. They take care of the people, and it's been a good good inspiration for me. Do you ever use any um, not off the shelf oils from them? So it's, it's only off the shelf oils. Off the shelf. Yeah, I mean, it, we, and we've been asked that question, and, and they could they could do if I if we came to them and said, hey, look, we have a special need for a special blend. Um, really, just I mean, the stuff is, is capable of taking such extreme punishment. I mean, when we when we began the relationship, the part that sold me, I didn't have to go to the technology center and. You know, drill all the engineers on you know why is their stuff you know, the best, but the, all they told me was that Penske and his IndyCar runs the same stuff that you can get at Walmart. 
question. And that was basically when the Pure Plus came out, and then Shan and her team kind of explained the whole, you know, uh, gas to liquid process, and it's kind of like you watch Moonshiner, it's kind of like it's, <laughs> it's like a still. You know, but the, pure, the, 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 the purity of it, and I'm like, you know, I was a Mobile One guy prior to that, and I'm like, you know, yeah, Mobile One is kind of like 1970s technology, and, uh, and we're getting ready to run the Venom for, we've been, We've been trying to break the Bugatti record. We were running in the two mid two sixties, and we're trying to get that last five mile per hour. And I thought, you know, hadn't really thought about the oil, or you know, if we might have a, a failure or get into that, you know, that 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 fine line of, you know, um, whether it's you know, temperature or oil pressure. I thought, you know, that's having that extra bit of safety margin would give us some good peace of mind. And, out and, well, we went out, let's see, we went out, we went to NASA, and um, the first time we went, we got rained out, and we didn't really get to run. We, got, we even got to make one last run of the day, and we went like 250 or something like that. I'm like, there's no more time, and I'm like, well, can we rent the track tomorrow? No, nope. somebody else got it. So mm -hmm. we, we came back like a month later, and uh, my wife asked me, we were leaving, leaving the Space Center, and she said, aren't you disappointed? I'm like, yeah, I'm here at uh, Kennedy Space Center, and this is like where the astronauts were. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. Mm. And I was just kind of all the whole thing. Like, no, we'll come back, we'll nail it. And a month later, we did. Donnie was with us. So, well, it, we and I really haven't talked about what was, what was your what was your impression of that? Well, I tell people the story. You know, to be there somewhat, just you know, knowing that what you just said there. We feel like you know we did give you a little edge with the lubricant, but knowing that the team was all in, right? So the day before the throttle body stuff, right? So mm -hmm. here we are, 3 a.m. FedEx shows up at 3 a.m. We're doing a huddle at the at the uh, hotel lobby at like 5 a.m., 5:30 a.m. Sure. And you know it was like, okay, this is a team deal, you know. So all hands on deck. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go immediately. I want YouTube. You know, taking this, I want plugs, this, this, and you got, and you guys laid out a plan, and you know, we we were facing some weather still, right? And um, uh, but just seeing that day go down, seeing kind of teamwork in action is always always impressive. Mm -hmm. um, but then just being there, part and, and seeing that I'm standing on Kennedy, the, the shuttle runway, and I'm at the end of the runway, and there's these brass plaques. And every time a shuttle came down, wherever the last before it stopped. They would mark it. Oh, I didn't see that. There's a brass plaque that really? says the mission and the date and all that stuff. Really? And I'm like, yeah, I understand. There's nobody. It's hallowed ground. Nobody, you know you don't get in there. Right. Like, nobody could ever been here. Right. From the public. You know, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm here, like, in the most historical kind of thing. Right. And then we're doing something totally, you know, be historical from my perspective with, with Shell. And uh, it was just an amazing day. You know, it went down, everything went safe. Yeah, uh, we celebrated it. Was, it was it was amazing. awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. It was really, it was really, really neat. Yeah. We need to do something like that again soon. Yeah. Yeah. And that was with your Venom? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Getting to yeah, the same yeah. car sitting down in the showroom. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to be at the same venue for the next record? <sighs> Depends on what we do. We're looking at some speed record stuff, we're looking at some road course stuff. So we'll see. But NASA, it's a beautiful place to test. It's just hard to get in there, and they're they, they're very um, they have a lot of rules. So you know, it's one thing we're just going to go there and test a car. Hope we have we have a video crew or people with us. It just gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. It worked. That worked out really well. I think we established a pretty good rapport with them via that. But you know, who knows? That was almost two years ago. We can try to go back down there again in the next six months. It might be a different group of people and. It may not be as easy to deal with. You're dealing with the government, you know. So, but that would probably be my first choice from the standpoint that the runway is 300 feet wide, it's 3.2 miles long, and it's NASA. It's the it's where they landed everything. You know, I mean, they used to land the space shuttles at, at Edwards in California, but I mean, it's where they landed them for the last probably 10 years or something. And uh, it's cool. I mean, even like uh, where we like staged the the cars, the car. Like, do you ever remember when they used to like land in Edwards and then they would load it on the top of a 747? Mm -hmm. Like they fly it across the country and then, so they would land on that runway and they have this huge 
metal gantry. That what, 10, 12 stories tall? Oh, it's That's enormous. to be 120, 150 feet high. And it's just basically the deal that plucks the shell off the top of the 747, the back out of the 747, put the shell on the ground, and the shell's you know, bigger than this whole showroom. I mean, it's you know, ginormous. Anyway, just the, you talk about technological achievements, whether it's with Pure Plus or the Venom, but the stuff that they were you know, doing 20, 30, 50 years ago, yeah. it's amazing. And you know, we walked in that one building where the weather kind of command center, mm -hmm. but in the building from 1960, obviously. Right. Oh, and, sure. and there was this hallway with these kind of, you remember like the old school building that the metal doors with the netting on inside the glass? Mm -hmm. So there's all these doors and they were like these mini mm -hmm. locker rooms and there's all these astronaut mission pictures. And I'm like, Huh? Okay, now I'm walking out of the daggum hallway where some astronauts were rolling through. Well, when we were the, like, the day Whoa. before, we were waiting for that front to come through, and the astronauts from 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 here, from from Clear Lake, they flew down on a T-38 in their little blue jumpsuits, and we're out there <laughs> chit-chatting with them and taking like, What are you doing? So we had three hours to burn, we just want to do some laps. Yeah. So you just zip over to Florida. Just fly, just fly over <laughs> and fly back, yeah. <laughs> the little T-38, yeah. Mm. That's pretty cool. He showed off when he took off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like when he like took off, came like, covered and yeah. I mean, like it's straight, straight vertical. Mm -hmm. It was like whoa. Yeah. We kind of have that feeling being here with you. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're very kind. It's well, very, um, we're glad to share what we do with y'all and fun to share it with other enthusiasts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go eat some barbecue? Yeah. Cool. We took him to Lupe's yesterday. I had to get him a doctor. Into the oh, there you go. Best. Absolutely. Houston's best. Well, let's uh, hit some Hensies here in a few minutes. Cool. Um, can I just, uh, or if you guys want to just, if you guys want to load up and, you know where Hensies is? Oh, well, we're going there. Yeah, we're going to go there. Okay. Yeah, I just, I felt like they, I mean, yeah. there was kind of like, it might be here at this time, it might be there at that time, and I just wanted to minimize kind of your downtime. So. <coughs> That's just the so, first sea leg there, right? Yeah. Yeah, just give or just give me five minutes. You guys can follow me, okay. and I'll meet you guys on the showroom. Sure. Anything else for anybody? All right. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Why don't we take a group? We'll come downstairs. Right. We'll take a group picture. That'd be cool. How's that situation for us a little bit? Uh, it's got upgraded uh, injectors. It's got headers. Um, upgraded camshaft and retuned. Yeah. <laughs>